Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the second last lesson before the summer holidays, if my plans go to uh, the timetable that I've drawn out. Um, I would like you. I would like to talk to you about two things today. I would like to continue um. The Bonding Continuum is one of them, which does sound like a Star Wars title. And yes, it's supposed to have two U's. And the other one, the other thing I want to talk to you about are these bad boys here. They deserve a bit more consideration because it is an incredibly weird molecule. We've already covered uh, one of its weirdness, but we'll have a look at a second one that you all take for granted. Uh, let me move my bicycle chain away. Sorry. There we go. Uh, so, the Bonding Continuum. What is this? This is basically an apology um, for dumbing things down. Uh, a long time ago, we told you, metal, non-metal, ionic. Two non-metals, covalent. Yeah, life is not usually as black and white as that in almost everything, unfortunately. And this is one of the cases where it's not. So if we have a look at the period running of the period of the period, we're running from sodium, and then magnesium, and then we've got aluminium, silicon, uh, what's next? Phosphorus, uh, sulfur, and chlorine. So, um, these are our groups. We won't talk about group 8, they don't play well with other children. If we were to join each of these elements to chlorine, which is something they used to look at um, in advanced higher, they've shifted it down to higher actually. This of course is going to be a covalent molecule, Cl2. Don't get much more covalent than that. In fact, to be precise, the shared pair of electrons bang in the middle because they have identical electron negativities. As you go across this way, if you remember the patterns in the periodic table, the electron negativity is going to decrease as you go across, which means this shared pair of electrons is going to start to move towards, oh, I should have done that further down, sorry, apologies. I'm going to move slightly more in the direction of the chlorine. And every time you click across one element here, electrons are going to move a bit more towards the chlorine because this is a constant EN and this is a decreasing EN. Can you see what's going to happen by the time you go over here? <laughs> so, uh, silicon, chlorine. I'm not going to talk about this guy because aluminium is just weird. If you do chemistry later on, you'll learn some of the weirdness about aluminium. It's fascinating because it's bang on the borderline between metal and non-metal. So it has some properties of both, believe it or not, crazy as that is. Um, and then by the time I come over to here, I'm hoping that you'll realise that the chlorine has said, do you know what, I'll just be keeping these electrons, thank you very much, entirely. They're no longer shared, and we end up with ionics. But I'm also hoping that you realise that this is probably an oversimplification of things. Perhaps magnesium chloride has some tiny wee covalent tendencies. Aluminium chloride certainly does. Aluminium chloride behaves more covalently than ionically. It's really interesting. And a continuum, folks, is just a gradual spread um, from one end to the other. Uh, and as you can see, we are slowly changing the polarity of this, these compounds, as we go from one side to the other. That's what the bonding continuum is. What on earth would the SQA ask you um, about this? Well, if it was me, I would perhaps leave this, uh, this would be a great open-ender, wouldn't it, where you could talk about all this nonsense. You can then go on to talk about electronegativity. You can mention the fact that this bond here is completely non-polar. Whereas these bonds here are obviously going to be polar covalent bonds. And then by the time you go over to here, the electrons are pretty much stuck on the chlorine, chloride sorry, all the time. So these are ionic. But the point being that the SQA want you to not judge a book by its cover. They don't want you to judge a compound by its formula. They want you to judge it instead by its physical properties. And I can completely see their point. Um, that's why if you were with me for National 5 or any further down the school, I always said, it's a rough guide, the non-metal metal thing, but the bulletproof test is to test its electrical conductivity. These guys here conduct only when melted or dissolved, and of course, if it's covalent, they just don't want to play with conduction. Um, 
And that's, I think, all I want to say about the bonding kiss. Oh, one last thing before we leave, sorry. There's the solubility, the, you'll come across another type of question. There's the open-ended questions where you can talk about this sort of stuff till the cows come home. And there are multiple choice questions. I've seen this pop up from time to time. And it will say something along the lines of, which um, of these compounds... Now, you've got a choice here. They can say is the most or least ionic character. That's the way they phrase it. Or they'll say which of these compounds has the most or least covalent character. That's the way they'll phrase it. Now, basically, what they're talking about here, guys, is if you're looking for the most ionic character, then I'm hoping that you could probably work out that uh, the most ionic character would have the largest delta En. Um, the least ionic character would have a small delta En. Uh, and the opposite concepts apply to this. Uh, the most covalent character would have zero delta En. So that would be this guy here. Um, and the least covalent character would have the largest delta En between the two that they're talking about. So what will they give you? They'll give you something like, in fact, they often do this, interestingly. They often give you something like, um, say, aluminium chloride, um, phosphorus uh, chloride, sulfur chloride, and um, Cl2. And basically, you, you go and look at the data book, find the En of this, find the En of this, and you're looking to match whichever they're asking for out of these four combinations. Happy with that? Great. Let's have a look at um, water uh, for one final time because uh, I've got, I thought I'd cheat because their diagrams are nicer than mine, um, I've got this here. So we've got lots of little water molecules. Um, a couple of things about water. The SQA only want you to know one property of water that's weird, but there are, there's quite a few. Um, we have already covered the anomalous boiling point of water. It should have been around about minus uh, 180, I think. Something like that. Um, minus 180. I'm very glad it's not, of course. Uh, the same, Incidentally, the same applies to hydrogen fluoride and ammonia. They both have a seriously higher boiling point than you would otherwise expect because of hydrogen bonding. If you remember back... I said that hydrogen bonding occurs when you've got two things, actually. A very large electronegativity difference. This uh, 3.5, I think. 2.2. Mm, I'd have to go and check. Um, and this guy here, this is physically quite a small charge. A small size of atom and hydrogen is as small as you can get. So you end up with a very much stronger version of dipole-dipole interaction. And we call it, because it's so much stronger, we call it a different name, and it's a hydrogen bond. And you only find it uh, when hydrogen is attached to nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine. Because these three here have sufficiently large values of their electronegativity. So, enough waffling here. Let's look at the picture. Could do with a glass of water, actually. My voice is going dry. On the picture here, we've got um, water molecules quote is being liquid water here, absolutely. So this would be my glass of water. And we have individual little water molecules. And of course, what we can do is we can patch in where the hydrogen bonds would form. They form between the delta minus here and the delta plus here. And I'll patch in here as well. And why not fill that in just for completeness? There we go. So there's my glass of water um, where the molecules are being held to, each, to their neighbours uh, considerably more strongly than they otherwise would be. Um, and that's why it's a nice liquid glass of water instead of a glass of steam. One of the properties of this boiling point, but the second property the SQA wants you to know about is density. I should have got myself a glass of icy water for this, because of course, if you take your ice cube, drop it in your glass of water, it floats. Everybody goes, yeah, of course it floats. It really shouldn't. Things get more dense when you chill them down normally. If you take liquid wax in a pan and drop a candle into it, which is solid wax, the candle goes dunk to the bottom of the pan. The same applies to liquid metals, you just can't see through them. Um, and liquid everything else except 
Well, pretty much these three guys, specifically water, and here is why. Look what's happened to the structure of solid water. Water does indeed become more and more dense. Now let's see if we plot density against, looks like destiny, <laughs> if you plot destiny against temperature. Um, and if we start with a decent temperature up here, you know, room temperature-ish, uh, we find that uh, as you cool the water down, it gets more and more dense. At about four Celsius, something happens. The molecules start to arrange themselves into these very nice hexagonal structures. It's almost as if they, they, um, they click into place like Lego. And the hydrogen bonds now hold the water molecules in these beautiful hexagonal patterns. So what? Well, there ain't nothing in here. That is empty space, which means you can see this is less dense than this. So the density falls sharply. Now that means if the density of something falls, you've got the same number of atoms, then it takes up a larger space. That is why two things happen. Number one, this ice cube is less dense than the liquid water, so it floats, which is weird enough. And number two, that explains why water, when it freezes, it expands. That's blowing holes in your pipes, for example, or causing the wonderful, wonderful scenery that we have here in Scotland. Why do you think we have all these great jaggy mountains? Because the water gets into the cracks in the rocks, freezes, expands, breaks the rocks off. Go and talk to your geography teacher. They know much more about this than I do. But the expansion of water is a consequence of it having hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds all uh, make the molecules line up in these beautiful hexagons which have got no, nothing inside them and are lower density and expand outwards. Um, uh, which, as I said, uh, is what makes ice float on water instead of sinking. Uh, just as a second thing, by the way, what shape are snowflakes? Six sides. It's not coincidental. Snowflakes are caused, the wonderful shapes that snowflakes are, are caused by the, the microstructures of this water molecule forming these nice interlocking hexagons in random fractal patterns. How cool is that? Uh, that's all I want to say today. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.